these are lists in effect so a lot of the stuff that we can do on strings we can do on lists a string is a list where each character has its own index value so if I have that then that is position 0 that is position 1 and that is position 2 So we talked about how to step through a list with a for loop. So go ahead and open the shell, not a program, but just a shell. Make a new list. All it needs to be is a list of numbers. 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, 9. You could write a for loop that would go through it. You know, so L sub 0 is 8. L subscript 1 is 6. L subscript 2 and so on is nothing if you type lowercase l. And there we go. It's a 10 pipe 309. If I give it an index value of negative 1, what is it going to print out? I think we mentioned this. Negative 1? If that's 0, 1, 2, yep, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Negative 1 is that, negative 2 is that, negative 3 is that, negative 4 is that. Now that's kind of idiosyncratic to Python. Don't expect that to work in a lot of other languages. But L negative 1, 9. Let's go ahead and pop open a program file now. Do the same thing. L is equal to 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, 9. If you want to see if the first value is 8, you could just write something like this. If L0 equals 8, print, yep, 8. If you wanted to see if the last one was equal to 9, that's the fastest, well, the easiest way. If we didn't want to use negative 1, if we wanted to be old school about it, we could get the length of the string and subtract 1 from it. But the syntax for that is kind of ugly. I don't know about you, but I'd rather use the negative one than do that. Both of them will get you the last element. Get the last element. Get the last element. Get the first element. So there's two ways we could go through this list. One is with a while loop or a for loop that uh, iterates a number and the other is using a variable that contains the element of the list itself. So let's demonstrate both ways. I'm not sure how much I've used for. I know I've, I've thrown it in occasionally but we're going to use the syntax for x in range 0 comma L -E -N -L. What this does is it starts counting at zero and it goes up to but not including the length, that number. So if the length was 10, it would count zero to nine, which is perfect for our list. Since this has seven digits, we can go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So the length of L is going to be six, so it will count zero through five. It may seem counterintuitive that the range goes up to, but not including that one. We just have to kind of get used to it. So if we have that, we could print out 
let's go ahead and print out the index number x and then L at position X. And let's go ahead and run it. And we don't think we called one lists yet. So lists.py. And so there we go. That for loop stepped zero through six. printing out the elements. There's a somewhat simpler syntax. I'm going to use, I don't know, E for element. For E in L. That sounds weird. For E space I N space capital L. Print E. And there we go. It, it printed the values out a second time. So what are the differences? The big difference is that this one has created a counter, an index value that goes from 0 on up to whatever it needs to be to print out the entire list. So that's being used for indexing. In this case, E actually contains a value out of the element, each one in succession. First time, it's got an 8. Second time, it's got a 7. The third time, it's got or 8, a 6, and a 7, and a 5 each in turn. So how would we add all those numbers up? We could use either kind of loop. We just do, need to initialize an accumulator variable, we're going to call it total, not sum, because sum is a function. Honestly, you could just write this if you wanted to. Print the sum of the list is comma sum parentheses L. Yeah. Yeah, boy, we're done. But of course, we're not going to do it the easy way. We're going to use a loop. For E in L, for every element in L, Whoops, I need to declare my total variable first. So above that for statement, total is equal to zero. Then for E, I, N, L, sum plus equals E. And we're going to print the total of the list is comma total. Whoops, what did I do wrong here? That line is wrong. Well, what did I call my variable? Total. total. Yeah, so that actually needs to be total. So let's make sure that that so-called sum and the so-called total match. Yeah. Yes, they do. Very common syntax for stepping through a list. If you want to find a specific value, you could do that. Go through it one by one. If you want to add them all up, you want to multiply them all together, you can do that. But lists have some functionality that we don't necessarily need to write. We don't need to write our own search function to see if an item is in the list. Let's find out if two is in the list. If 2 in L print, yes, there's a 2. Else colon print no 2 found. And no 2 was found due to our data. A six seven five three oh
so I tabbed away from this. Does everybody have this working? If you walk in late, I could print it out. Sure thing. I hope so. Yes. And as always, I apologize for the last one. Figure it out, I hope. All right, so I'm going to go hit Think Like a Computer Scientist, Chapter 11 about lists. So a list is an ordered collection of values. We want to get fancy about a name. The values that make up a list are called its elements or items. I keep using the word elements. We will use the word element or item to mean the same thing. A list is similar to a string, which is a col ordered collection of characters. But a list can be anything. You could have a list of turtles, you know, list of names, a list of numbers, a list of floats, whatever. Yes, sir? I can print one out. Anybody else? Bless you. how to declare a list. You use these square braces, brackets. You never can decide which to call them. So this is a list of four integers. This is a list of three strings. And unlike some languages, or a lot of languages, you can mix the types. You could do this. I'm just going to delete it as soon as I type it in. But if I wanted to, I could do L2 is equal to, you know, and I'm going to put some different things in here. Fred, one, you know, if I made a turtle, I could put T the turtle in there. Now, when you do that, it just kind of makes it hard to, you better really know what you're doing if you're going to stick things like that in there, because you couldn't use a simple for loop to process it. How would you know whether that position was supposed to be a string or whether it was supposed to be an integer or a turtle or whatever? You can even put a list inside of a list, which is bizarre. Kind of going to leave that thought alone. If you want to change the value of a list, we can do that. Let's go back to our code. First, let's add something to our list. Let's add the 1405 to that phone number we have in here. So L is equal to 1, 4, 0, 5 plus what the list already had. And then just to make sure that's good, let's print it out. But let's print it out the easy way. All right, now it says one four five eight six seven five three nine. The number inside the braces is called the index. You can use it to access a value. You can use it to print it out. Here we were using it to check, you know, is that a nine or not? Is that a zero or not? But you can also change it. We want the first number to be a 10 for who knows what reason. We could do L sub zero is equal to 10. 
Then if we printed it out again, it would no longer say 1405, it would say 10405, which is even dumber, but let's go for it. Yep. Yeah. If you access an element, the index of an element that does not exist, you get a runtime error. That's why doing it with that for loop is a really good idea, the second kind of for loop, because we are guaranteed pretty much that this is never going to fail if we do it like that. There's no indexing involved. It's handling everything, so we can't drop the ball and mess anything up. Whereas here, yeah, it's, it's likely to work, but when you're, into, when you're accessing the list with these index values like that, if that if position doesn't exist, it will blow up. So you can use a loop variable as an index. I was counting at a counter. Loop variable. Here they do something different rather than that range. When you're using a for loop, you could specify the range of values using range, or you could itemize them like that. Let's go tack on a few examples like that just for fun. For i in range, I want to start at 10 and go up to but not including 15. So that's going to print 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Print i. for i in, and let's just list some numbers. 2, 5, 10, 20, whatever. Put a colon there and print those out. And it did work. It printed 2, 5, 10, and 20, and it printed all the numbers between 10 and 14 inclusive. I almost never use that syntax. And if I was going to use that syntax, I would make this a list beforehand. I would cut that, put something like nums equals that list, and then I would do for i in nums. To me, that's clear. Maybe the other way is clear to you. You could do it like that. So I'm going to undo those changes and leave it as is, as was. There we go. Going through a list like this is called traversing the list. In such a case, that loop counter isn't used for anything except indexing, in which case we might want to use the more direct version. Horseman is equal to war, famine, pestilence, and death. 4H in horseman, print H. If you want to get the length of the list, you can do it like that, L-E-N parentheses list. You want to do that when you want to make sure you're going from the beginning of the list to the end. So list membership. If you want to see if pestilence is in our four horsemen of the apocalypse, pestilence in, or if pestilence in list, then it would do true. Now debauchery is not one of the four horses of the apocalypse. Horsemen of the Apocalypse. So if you do if debauchery in Horsemen, it'll print false. We're going to skip the, skip the idea of loops embedded in, excuse me, lists embedded in lists for now. You can add two lists together. We did that when we put uh, 1405 at the beginning of it. Weirdly, you can even multiply lists together. Let's go back to the shell. Run Python shell. Let's make a list that just says 1, 2, 3. n equals 1, 2, 3. And let's do c's. I'm just making up letters. 
C is equal to N times 10. Then print out C by typing C and hitting return. There it goes. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. It's bizarre, but you can multiply lists together, and it just depends it to itself the specified number of times, in this case, 10 times. List slices. We showed this on Thursday. If you want to start from here and go to here, you can take a slice starting at zero and going up to three because it goes up to but not including the second number. So that would get that one, which is position index zero. That's index one and that's index two. If we want to get that one and that one, then we would start at one, go up to two, but not including three. And my mental shortcut for figuring out how long that list is going to be is take the second number, subtract from it the first number, and that's how long the list is going to be. If you leave out the first number, it assumes zero. If you leave out the last number, it assumes all the way to the end. So, let's print out our list getting the first five, five values of it. I could put the zero there. I could leave the zero out. Now let's print from the fifth element all the way to the end. Print L fifth. And I could do this, but it's it's tacky looking. You know, that would cause it to go to the end. But instead I'm just gonna leave off the second number and that, that lets it go to the end. So 10, 4, 0, 5, 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, 9. We've got the first five values this way. I'm going to take that zero off and put it here. And then we got the everything after that from index five all the way to the end of the list that way. So lists are mutable, meaning they can be changed. We can modify their elements. That actually doesn't work with a string, that would imply, because it says, unlike strings, lists are mutable. I want to test that. I'm going to go back to the shell. I'm going to make a string. N for name is equal to my name. And then I'm going to try to look at the first letter, N sub 0. That's a J, and then I want to change in sub zero to something else. I'm no longer Jeff, I am Beth with a B. Oops, type that wrong. Equals quote B. And it says it does not support item assignment. So lists do one thing that strings do not, which is let you change the elements. There is something called a tuple. A tuple is not defined with the square brackets, it's defined with parentheses, and you can't change those. So if you did this, L is equal to, you know, 4, 0, 5, you could still print out the first position, but you could not change it. Whereas if we had made it a list, change that to a 9. does not support item assignment. We're not going to talk more about tuples at this time. I just want you to get the idea that some things you can change the elements in them and some things you can't. In strings, strings are a little bit harder to deal with in this language because you can't change them like that. In some languages you can.
list deletion. Say we don't want a specific element in our list. Remember how we added that 1405 to our list? Let's see if we can remove those. Delete L zero and we had one four oh five. So we're gonna go up to position one, two, three, four, but not including four. And then let's print it out again. Let me make sure I got the syntax to that right before I run it. Yeah. And we're back to our original list, 8675309. So let's add a comment here. Delete first four items from list. If you don't want to delete a slice of it, you don't use the colon. You know, if you just want to delete the first character or the last one or whatever, delete L sub zero would remove the first. That's just going to say 675309. So here is something to consider. If we do this, A is equal to L. A is not a copy of the list. A is a reference to the list. So if we then delete again the first character, and let's delete the last character. and then we print A, we might expect A not to have been changed. All we did is we deleted something from L. Why would that affect A? Because those are actually pointing to the same list. We will see that it is gone from A. because they both reference the same list. But if you want to make a copy of the list and store it into something else, you could do this. B is equal to A, starting at position zero and going out to the end. That's a goofy syntax, but B is a copy of A. So now if we remove A last character, delete A's last character, A negative one, and then we print B, we will see that it did not delete that last character. Let's print both lists so that we can tell the difference. Print A equals comma A print B equals comma B. And so when we deleted that item from A, well, here, we deleted the 9 from L, but we printed out A, and it showed that 9 removed from A as well, because they both referred to the same memory. Here, B is a copy of A, so when we deleted something from A, it did not change B. Just kind of remember that if you want to copy one list to another for some reason, you can't just do that. 
you have to do that. So to make a copy of a list, do something like L1 is equal to, or L2 is equal to L1, starting at the beginning and going all the way to the end. Great big slice. Slice it and incorporates the whole item, the whole list. Did I really close the uh, browser? In their terms, if you do it like this, B is equal to A, they call that aliasing. If you do it like this, B is equal to A with a colon in there, it calls that cloning. I guess I will update my script accordingly. A is a reference to the list. So I'm just going to add the comment cloning there. L3 is equal to L1 aliasing. So lists and for loops. We've seen how to do that. For temporary variable in list, print that temporary variable. Now this is a great idea. Make a list that has a plural, friends, and then make your temporary variable just the same thing without the S. But I've learned through bitter experience that if I use that example up here, then people leave out the S here. You know, or they put one in there and they leave that one out and it takes us a while to debug it. So it's a great idea, you know, Names is equal to all that for name in names. Great conceptually. Hard to type along with and get right. Okay, now we're going to do something completely different, yet somewhat similar. Yay. Let's go and make a file called password.py. So let's make a password. Password is equal to hello dot there. If we wanted to see if that period was in there, how could we do that? Same way we check to see if the number two was in our list. What key did we what keyword did we use? If. Yeah, if something in. So if period in password print. Yes, there was a period. Else colon print no period. Yes, there was a period. Now that's great if we wanted our criteria to be that there was a period in the password. But really the rules are, what kind of password rules have you seen? Rules 
yeah, it's got to have uppercase letters, it's got to have lowercase letters, it's got to have numbers and special symbols, and maybe no spaces. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go through that password letter by letter, character by character, seeing which of these counting up how many uppercase letters there are and how many lowercase letters there are and things like that. So firstly, let's just write a loop that'll process it. For character in password, print character. It printed out hello dot there. Good. We don't really need that one in the future, that print statement, but we'll just leave it there for now. So let's establish some counters. We want to find out if there are any spaces, but before we start, there's no spaces in it. We want to find out how many uppercase letters there are. We want to find out how many lowercase letters there are how many digits and how many specials so we need some if statements that will compare that single character the spaces is the easiest if character equals a space add one to spaces. Spaces plus equals one. Now to check the rest of them, these are broader categories rather than just, um, you know, checking it for a space or something like that. So we need to know some string functions. Let's see if I have a chart already made up of string functions. Nope, so we'll make one. Okay. To check to see if a letter is lowercase. We will use character dot is upper. Let me make sure there's no capitalization on that. Yes. To check if uppercase, we use care dot way. If it's lowercase, we use is lower. If we use uppercase, we use is upper. To see if it's a digit, care dot is digit. To see if it is a digit or an alphabet character, we use care dot is alpha num. That stands for alphanumeric. That's all the letters. All the letters plus all the numbers. That leaves out all the, uh, you know, the special symbols, the spaces and the commas and the stuff like that. Leaves out punctuation. A 
certain point we will make this chart prettier. Does that handle all of our stuff? We need to know spaces. We know how to get spaces. Uppers, lowers, digits, and specials. Well, there's no is special. But if it's not an alpha or a numeric, if it's not a, uh, a letter or a digit, then we know it's a special character. So let's check for uppercase. If care dot is upper, colon, uppers plus equals one. Now let's check to see if it's a special character. If care dot is, I'm sorry, it's not alpha num, it's just al num. It's an abbreviation. Is al num equals false if it's not true. Or we could just put the word not in front of it like that. I'm going to delete that equal equal false and just leave that not there. Then the specials plus equals one. All right, that checks the entire string counting the number of spaces, the number of uppercase letters, and the number of specials. Now let's implement our logic. Our logic is, have I already got our logic up here? Nope. A password must be at least eight in length. We don't even have that, but we can always get the length of the password just by using len. Contain one uppercase and one lowercase, or contain at least one uppercase and one lowercase letter. One digit and one special character. So we can write some if statements. So as always, there's more than one way to do these, but we're going to write an if statement, several if statements. We are going to assume that it's a good password. So is good equals true, with a capital T, is good is equal to true, but now we're going to start our if statements. If len of the password is less than 8, is good equals false, capital F. And let's print out an error. Must be eight or more characters. And you know what? Go back up to the top and change that place where we assign password equal to hello.world or whatever it was, and let's do an input statement instead. So as soon as I hear the keys stop typing on this, go put an input statement up at the top that says password is equal to input quote. What is your new password? Something like that. All right, so here we go. Instead of password is equal to hello there, Let's change this to password is equal to input, enter new password, colon, like that. So that's our new line up here at the very top. And let's run it. Right now it's only checking length. It's doing all the rest, but it's only checking length. You know, it's counting everything. So, Bob. No period. We could comment that out. We don't care if there's a period or not. It's printing them out letter by letter. Must be eight or more characters. So, our first check worked. 
I'm going to scroll back down here. Pause. I'm going to re take this logic out. Move it up here for now. And make sure that everybody's got this much going. If you want to work ahead, also make have it make sure that it's got at least one uppercase. So if uppers greater than zero, and make sure that it's got at least one specials, if specials greater than zero. So let's keep going. If uppers is equal to zero, print must have at least one uppercase letter. And we need to check set is good equal to false there too. The reason why we have that that's called a flag, that is good variable. At the very bottom of it, we're going to do if is good, print good password. That way we don't. That way we can list all the errors, but if there are no errors, we can tell them it's a good password. kind of feel like making a change to that, but nah. Okay, so if specials equals zero colon print must have at least one special character symbol. Non-letter symbol. However they say it. Is good equals false. We could have used else ifs. But if we did, it would only print the first kind, the first error it found. It wouldn't tell you that both it has to have an uppercase letter and it can't have any spaces like that. It would only print the first one. So we're making it where it will print out all the errors. Let's go ahead and check spaces. If spaces is greater than zero, we got to print no spaces in password. Is good equals false. Print no spaces in password. See if it works. Enter new password. Hello there. No punctuation, no spaces. Really need to get rid of that no period statement. Okay, our error is must have at least one non letter symbol. There's more problems with it, really, according to our rules up there, but we haven't implemented all of our rules. I'm going to type in something with a space now. And something that's too short. Ho, ho. There we go. Doesn't have any specials, doesn't have any uppercases, and it has a space and it's too short. Must be eight or more characters. Must have at least one uppercase letter. No spaces in the password. It did count the space as a special character in this case. I guess that's okay. Alright, the rest of this is going to be up to you to implement. 
So we've implemented some of the rules. Let's list the rules a little bit more carefully. A password must be at least eight in length. I'm gonna and have no spaces and contain at least one uppercase, one upper. Contain at least one lower. This is getting tedious. And at least one digit. And one special character. Those are our rules. How many of these did we check for? Which of these did we not accommodate already? You mean on the very last password you gave it? Well, any password. Oh. Our logic here takes care of some of these rules, but not all of them. Let's just step through them. Are we checking the length of the password? Are we checking to see if it has spaces? No, um, where my brain to go. see, here's our logic. Oh, you mean compare those two. I got right, you. these are our rules. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, these are our rules. This is our implementation. So we are checking to see if it's eight in length. We're doing that there. Are we checking to see if it has no spaces? Are we checking to see if it has uppercase? Are we checking to see if it has a lowercase? Nope. Everybody see that? We don't have if lowers equals to zero or anything like that. Are we checking for digits? Specials. Digits are not special. So no digits. That's unimplemented, but specials is implemented. So we're going to put two exclamation marks by the ones that we have not done yet. All right, and as a stretch goal, I, we're gonna add a completely stupid rule, which is that at least one character must be a Z. Stupid, but bonus rule. Get that, you get extra credit on it. All right, we forgot to add the final if statement, which was that if, you know, print out whether it was a good password or not. So let's do that. Our final thing above the all the ifs is print is the password good question mark end quote is good And let's run it. Make sure we haven't broken it somehow. New password. Ho ho. I'm going to get rid of the no period thing. I keep saying I'm going to scroll all the way back up here. We don't care about these things anymore. So just comment those three, those four lines out. If period and password print, yes, there was a period, else print no period. I'm leaving it in there because maybe you could use that code to check for lowercase z, the, the bonus. All right, I'll make an assignment page up. It's just going to contain this source code and, um, you know, these rules down here.
And we are done with class, so let me make a Dropbox. Or two.